Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan traveled to Beijing at the end of last week for the Olympic opening ceremonies and a meeting with President Xi. China is a neighbor, as is India, of course. On its other flank, Pakistan borders Iran and Afghanistan. That neighborhood makes Khan's country the hub of much intrigue and conflict. Prime Minister Imran Khan joins me now for an exclusive interview. Prime Minister Imran Khan, pleasure to have you here on, sir. My pleasure for you. Um, let me first ask you about what for much of the world and certainly for the United States seems to be a, a, you know, a very urgent situation, which is what is going on in Afghanistan. Um, Pakistan is, of course, bearing the brunt of it. The UN estimates you have already taken in almost two million refugees. Um, what, how bad are things on the ground and what could happen uh, in the next weeks or months if there isn't a, a change in the situation? Well, Fareed, you know, people in the U.S. must understand one thing. Disliking Taliban government is one thing, but it's a question of uh, 40 million, almost 40 million Afghans. Half of them uh, are in a very precarious situation. So there's hunger, there's one of the Afghan winters is, is extremely wicked ruthless and so they're facing winter they are the food shortages malnutrition uh, the next uh, couple of months everyone is worried that they could be one of the worst or already developing into one of the worst humanitarian crises have you found it e possible easy to deal with the taliban is the you know because with the u.s concern is that the taliban is not giving guarantees on women's rights and things like that what is your experience and what is your advice to the U.S.? Well, look for it. What are the choices? Is there a, an alternative to Taliban right now? No, there isn't. Is there a chance that uh, if, if, there's, if the Taliban are squeezed, if the government is squeezed, there could be a change for the better? No. So the only alternative we have right now is to work with them and incentivize them in, in, in what the world wants, inclusive government, human rights, women rights in particular. That's the only way forward right now. And the flip side is, if they are abandoned or these sanctions stay there and the banking system uh, has no liquidity left because of the sanctions, then the worry is that Afghanistan could go into chaos, humanitarian crisis, chaos. And then from Pakistan's point of view, we face two problems. We already have three million Afghan refugees. There, th there were three uh, terrorist groups operating from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Uh, they were right now with the Taliban government. Uh, unfortunately, when the, when, when the flood of refugees came, we have almost 250,000 uh, Afghans crossing into Pakistan. Now, amongst them, unfortunately, have these terrorists. There's the Pakistani Taliban, which is which has conducted attacks inside Pakistan. There's the Baloch uh, insurgents who've been uh, uh, conducting attacks, and especially recently. And then there's ISIL. So, uh, our best hope is that a stable Afghanistan will ensure uh, stability or peace in Pakistan. But it's not just Pakistan, because if it goes into chaos, then we know why the, the U United States first came to Afghanistan uh, 20 years back. So therefore, it's in everyone's interest that this does not descend into chaos, the situation in Afghanistan. Would you argue that the United States should recognize the Taliban government? Well, sooner or later, uh, the Taliban would have to be recognized. Now, the question is, the world wants some guarantees before they recognize the Taliban. So how far is the U.S. going to push the Taliban to actually conform to what they expect them uh, in terms of human rights? Now, this is the question. Can, will the Taliban go all the way? Are they capable of going all the way? Bearing in mind that this is a very strong ideological movement, uh, they represent a culture which uh, is completely alien to the Western societies. 
So therefore, uh, somewhere it, it there has to be give and take, but not recognizing them and freezing their accounts and uh, 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 their banking system, uh, the only people who are going to suffer is not the Taliban government because no one can replace them right now. But what will happen is that the, the half the population of Afghanistan, which is about 20 million people, are at a severe risk. You were a very eloquent critic of um, U.S. policy in the broader Middle East, of Afghanistan, Pakistan, with regard to the military actions. You would always argue that those actions, the drone attacks and such, fed uh, the forces that, that produce terrorism. Um, now, what I'm, what I'm struck by is you have ISIS or ISIL uh, attacking in Iraq, attacking in Syria, attacking in Pakistan, as you say, in Afghanistan. The, the, the U.S. is out. What is fueling the terrorism we are still seeing in the broader M Middle East? Is it all Sunni versus Shia? Is it what, what are the roots of this terrorism now? Well, the U.S. war on terror actually bred terrorists. Uh, I can tell you from the Pakistan's uh, example because Pakistan, by joining the U.S., you had 80,000 people dying in this uh, uh, joining the U.S. war on terror. And we saw the war, as it went along, it produced more terrorists. And I, I'm convinced it's exactly the same what happened in Afghanistan because these night raids in Afghanistan, the drone attacks, drone attacks, really the United States must review this policy. We watched what happened there. They were telling uh, people in the U.S. that the drones were very accurate and the people, they actually got the terrorists. Bombs exploding in villages. You know, how, how would they only get the terrorists? So there was a lot of collateral damage and I'm afraid uh, people in the U.S. did not really, the public does, does, didn't know the amount of collateral damage. We bore the brunt because what happened was we were considered collaborators of the U.S. So the, all the, the, the revenge attacks were against the Pakistani soldiers, against the people of Pakistan. There were suicide attacks uh, all going all over the country. We lost 80,000 people. But the U.S. has withdrawn and the terror continues. Uh, much less. Uh, free the, you can't compare now. I mean, during the height of this uh, war on terror, we were... Islamabad was a fortress. I mean, you had suicide attacks going everywhere. So, um, the, compared to what used to happen now, you know, terrorism is uh, is almost insignificant now. Prime Minister, you're just back from China, and I want to ask you: you 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 have strongly supported China, including in its actions in Xinjiang. You're the leader of one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, the United States, United Kingdom. Canada, Australia, as you know, have boycotted the Olympics diplomatically because they say China is engaging in what they term a cultural genocide against Muslims in Xinjiang. Do you see it differently? Uh, for, firstly, we had our ambassador, uh, Abin al uh, He He went to uh, uh, Xinjiang and he, according to his observations, the picture is not what was uh, being portrayed uh, on the Western media. But more importantly, from our point of view in Pakistan, Kashmir is a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. Uh, over the last 35 years, approximately, the figure varies, about 100,000 Kashmiris have died. Since 5th August uh, two, uh, 2019, uh, the, uh, the Indians have revoked the status of Kashmir uh, which unilaterally, which is, according to the United Nations Security Council, a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. There are extrajudicial killings going on. There are no rights there. There's clam down there. There are 800,000 Indian troops in, in the Kashmir Valley. Now, I find it very difficult that there is hardly any indignation about what is happening in Kashmir compared to what is happening or what they say is happening in Xinjiang. So that, that's where I disagree with this. We as Pakistanis feel very strongly that this should be even-handed. Yes, if, if firstly, uh, Kashmir is different because it's disputed between Pakistan and India, confirmed by the U United Nations Security Council resolution. 
So for that, us, this is the immediate issue right now. And I'm afraid uh, it do just doesn't get the attention it deserves. Are you saying that the treatment of Muslims in Kashmir is worse than the treatment of Muslims in Xinjiang? Uh, there would be absolutely no comparison. And I, have, I only have one source, and this is our ambassador in China, who has compared the two. There is no comparison there. I mean, in Kashmir, what is happening is criminal. But whatever is happening in Kashmir, do you condemn what is happening in China to, to Muslims there? If I believe the, the Western media, uh, unfortunately, um, right now, you know, Farid, we are sadly, and I hope it doesn't happen, we are heading towards another Cold War. And we all know once, you know, you, these sides are taken, then, the, you know, you, you, do you believe the, which side do you believe? Because two sides are completely different. What China is saying is completely different to what the U.S. is saying or, or the Western media is saying. So who do you believe? That's why we asked our ambassador to give us uh, his opinion. And it's not, you know, what is uh, appearing in the Western media. But my point is that right now, uh, what should not happen is that we should not be heading towards another Cold War. And because then there's a lot of propaganda involved and you don't know what the truth is. Let me ask you about relations with, with India. This is a very a topic everybody in the world is concerned about because, of course, both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. Um, do you see any prospect for uh, a greater degree of peace, uh, better relations, more trade, more tourism, all the kind of things that would lift the economies of both India and Pakistan? Well, Fareed, as you would know, I'm probably one of the, those Pakistanis who knows India and understands India much more than, you know, the rest of my own countrymen and probably all over the world. And so because of my friendships in India and my uh, relations with, uh, uh, with all sorts of, whether it was media, it was politicians, so the moment I, my government came into power, the first thing I did was reach out to India. And I, you know, I said, look, you, uh, you come one step towards us, we'll go two towards you. And our only issue is Kashmir. And we should solve it like na good neighbors on the dialogue table. But unfortunately, I mean, there's a tragedy unfolding in India. The, an ideology, the RSS ideology has taken over India. And we all know, and right now we have this, uh, we are in this day of information technology. All you have to do is Google who were the founding fathers of RSS, which, which the ideology that rules India right now, and uh, who were they inspired by, you know, uh, by the Nazis. Uh, th this is all uh, what I'm saying is can easily be verified. So it's a racist ideology which has taken over India. Remember, three times the RSS was uh, was uh, considered a terrorist organization, uh, an ideology that assassinated the great Gandhi. So therefore, this is a it's very difficult to come to terms with this ideology. And you know, my experience has been I tried everything, made overtures, but unfortunately, how do you deal with it? which an ideology which is based on hate, racial superiority and hate, hate for Muslims, minorities, Christians, and of course, Pakistan. Uh, so we haven't made any headways. Uh, but my worry is, Farid, it is what is going on in India right now is much, much more damaging for, for India than for, for Pakistan right now. We just have our relationship is frozen. But events in India... And the India I knew, uh, I think it's uh, it's of great concern. In the in the atmosphere you're describing, though, one does worry one one terrorist attack, one you know miscalculation on the border uh, could spiral out of control. Does that worry you? Yes. Uh, in fact, I went to my first uh, speech in the United Nations. I raised this concern because what happened was there was a attack in, in India, a Kashmiri youth blew himself up uh, on an Indian military convoy and Pakistan was blamed. 
And I immediately asked them, Broker, if you have any evidence that Pakistan was involved, we'll take action. But rather than um, uh, giving us any evidence, they, uh, they, plain, they plain bombed us. And so Pakistan also uh, retaliated and their plane was shot down. We immediately returned the pilot uh, just to tell them that, look, we had no plans of escalation. So, uh, you know, it could e easily have uh, escalated. And therefore, I think uh, this, which is why when I met President Trump, I asked him that, you know, we, the most powerful country should, it's very important to solve this Kashmir issue because it's been festering. Uh, it's uh, the world community has uh, pledged to the Kashmiris that they would be able to decide their own destiny. And if this issue keeps continuing, there's always a chance that, uh, you know, two uh, nuclear powers could be confronting each other. So, yes, the answer to your question is, yes, it concerns me. Imran Khan, pleasure to have you on. Okay, Fareed, thanks a lot.